Hi, I'm Wendy Haslam. I'm um, a senior lecturer in screen studies at the University of Melbourne and the director of the Bachelor of Arts as well. I just wanted to welcome the artistic director of the Melbourne International Film Festival, and that is the amazing Al Kossa, um, to talk with us about cinema, about um, MIF 68 and a half, and also to talk through some of the elements of our own Faculty of Arts partnership, which is a long and um, ongoing partnership that we've actually had with MIF for about 17 years now, I think, Al. So we created this partnership um, uh, looking for um, experiences for our screen studies students so that they could work uh, work and experience what it's like to work in a film festival. So it's been long and ongoing. And I remember when we first started it, we were, um, the word internship wasn't even used at that stage. So we had to kind of create it and imagine it anew. So such a pleasure to work with MIF and to have been working on this partnership for so long. And a real pleasure to um, welcome Al to talk with us about film. Thank you so much for having me here, Wendy. Um, yeah, it, it's an absolutely wonderful alignment. It's something that we really value in, in terms of our festival and also our capacity to, to put on the festival. It's something that really enables us in, in, in different ways in a very practical sense in terms of internship support. Um, it's, you know, I, th I think it's really brought up a, a huge amount of really interesting works and interesting projects that we've been able to pursue specifically because of that association with the University of Melbourne. Um, the students have been an incredible force as, as the interns within programming um, and, and some really amazing talent and some people have gone on to do um, some fascinating projects of their own. So we're very grateful for the partnership alignment um, and, and, and for all of the incredible people who have been a part of MIF because of it. How can we start? And we just wanted to ask you uh, whether you recall the first film that you watched in cinema. The very first film? Well, I grew up in New Zealand. I'm originally from Auckland and I moved to Melbourne in 2004. So the memories I have of the very first film, I think it would have been what was probably at the time a very new multiplex, the Mid-City Complex in Queen Street, Auckland. And the way I remember it, my dad um, took me in and he gave me the choice of seeing either Back to the Future or the Aristocats, the Disney cartoon. Um, and I think I chose the Aristocats and I love being at the movies to the extent that I actually made him come back the next day and uh, go to Back to the Future with me. So even then I was developing some good binge watching capacities, which has uh, helped me later in life in this role, I would say. You're a, a early, early adopter of the binge watching <laughs> approach. So I also um, uh, had animation as my first film. So I have a really vivid memory of um, going to see Walt Disney's film, The Jungle Book. Um, and this was a great film. It was a perfect film for my older sister. <laughs> but for me, I was really, really, really young. And um, actually it was a little bit too much. So <laughs> the screen was gigantic, like I'd never seen before. You know, the color was so vivid. Um, and the sound was so loud. And I could just imagine that, um, you know, that jungle kind of inviting me in where I knew there were lions and other creatures. So I found it really fascinating, but also a little bit terrifying at the same time. <laughs> yeah, just that experience of being in a cinema as much as what, as what you're watching on screen, that kind of immersion and that just overwhelmingness of, of the sound and the vision is something that really strikes a chord, even at a, at a very early age. Yes, I think for me it was also very much um, something that um, uh, was, you know, very much defined my first uh, experience, but also my growing interest in film as well. So I think it was precisely because of that first encounter um, that um, and that all sensory encounter and that encounter with a screen that was so enormous and the scale of the screen as well that um, really kind of influenced why I'm interested in film now. So the idea of being impacted on all of my senses. But and I think the, um, the idea of seeing something communally as well is something that you really respond to even at an, an early age as well. The feeling of, you know, being part of an audience is something that's quite new and something that's quite exciting in terms of 
learning how people respond, I think, dynamically in a room to a story on a screen um, is something that is, is a huge discovery. You're responding to something personally, but you can see that mirrored or perhaps indifference of those around you. And that makes the experience of being part of an audience something that's really unique and really interesting, um, even when you're very young as well. That's what I was thinking, Al, that um, it's really part of the unique attraction for myth as well, being part of that audience and being part of that audience to see a film uh, for the first time with that audience, or maybe even to see a film that won't be screened publicly as well, that rare and unique experience of being part of that audience at myth. That's really, yeah, one of the real joys of, of a festival. Um, and people are, you know, very adept at multitasking the media between all of their kind of streaming devices. And, and that experience as, I guess, audience members and as individuals watching content is something that's commonplace. But there's no substitute for going to a festival and seeing those kinds of films that exist there only and they don't exist in commercial settings or theatrical settings and there's still that feeling that this is a a, a once and a, you know an only opportunity in terms of what you could see um and you know we definitely see in myth those audiences who are and we call them our essence audience those kind of pure cinephile types who might take three weeks off work and see 80 films and really commit to that scale festival experience so you know we have an adventurous audience and we can program um, knowing that with some confidence so you know last year we had um, a film by Mariana Venus which is the floor which was you know uh, in production for a decade or so it's a 14-hour work and you play that and it sells out and people go with it. They go with the real experience of it. Um, and then they go and see, you know, a comedy or a, a drama or some other kind of piece of world cinema at night. Um, you can really combine your experiences in a festival to go from horror to um, experimental works, to a talk, to some kind of very kind of outre sort of only at myth experience. Um, and that's something which is really unique and really kind of special, I think, in, in our context. And, and something that, yeah, at an audience level really makes the festival what it is, that people are willing to branch out and, and take their chance, yeah. Absolutely, and I see that, and I see that every year, Al. So mm -hmm. Miff and you and Michelle and everyone who's been involved for the longest time have developed that over so many years and, in fact, grown that commitment mm -hmm. and that kind of assurance that your audiences will kind of go with you and take a risk as well. Which is and I think every festival has a personality to it. And, you know, with, with MIF, I mean, the scale of it is enormous. I mean, last year we're talking 386 films um, playing to, you know, an annual attending audience of around about 190,000. Um, and so as the program as well, it can be very, very overwhelming for people. And you want to create a context and an environment where you know, you can branch out in different directions. So, you know, there's always going to be a place for those films which are a bit broader, a bit more populist, um, have a bit more degree of public visibility and anticipation for them because in a sense, they're quite welcoming to the festival program. Um, there's something that keep the doors open and brings in kind of new audiences, um, right through to things which are very formally adventurous and very experimental and very challenging even for a cinephile audience. So you come in with some of those, I guess, broader films and maybe you take a chance and a little bit of a risk and you step through the program and then you kind of find yourself, I guess, reaching your limits and going beyond them in terms of what you watch. And that's something that's really appealing to us, I think, as programmers and as a festival. Yes, and as someone who's been going to MIF for so many years and actually was a volunteer at MIF when I was doing my undergraduate degree, um, I really valued that as well. The mixture of kind of um, anticipation and certainty that I knew that I was going to see a film by a particular director that I'd been so looking forward to but then the opportunity to take those risks as well and um, you know we've been really pleased to work with MIF in some of those areas of risk taking so I know that um, previously we've worked with you on things like the Simon Pummel exhibition do you remember that when he was exhibiting his work in 3D at Seventh mm. Gallery, I think it was. That's right. That's one of the projects I had in mind when I knew I'd be um, speaking to you because that was something that was um, quite new, I think, for our festival as well, was branching out into, I guess, 
uh, visual art, essentially. Um, Simon Pummel, this was 2012, I believe, was at the festival with a work called Shockhead Soul. So he had these incredible 3D, um, I guess those anaglyphic red, blue kind of 3D glasses, it's what you wore with them. Um, pieces that were a particular expansion of his work that we did, yeah, in 7th Gallery on Gertrude Street. Um, and it was, yeah, it was an extraordinary way to, I guess, deepen an appreciation and, and an immersion in a piece of work. And, you know, we've, we've looked at ways to kind of keep doing that and keep surprising audiences. And that's where things like, say, Mythia has emerged from in 2016, or perhaps a vertical cinema um, in recent years as well. We look at how we can really do something which is uniquely myth and, you know, which is, is one of a kind only myth experiences for audiences and which really give a different in that you could get to films than any other context. Yes, and I think you mentioned vertical cinema, which really did, really was an example of exactly that, that mm -hmm. unique experience of watching film on that incredibly, you know, elongated vertical cinema um, was uh, amazing. And to have that uh, the group of um, artists and filmmakers from Amsterdam come out and create that and then come in and talk to our students was incredibly valuable and um, a real highlight for our students and you know such a unique experience. Yeah as audience members a pure kind of visceral experience like yeah, again returning that sense of this overwhelming kind of um, visual experience, a very visceral kind of thing. Um, as an audience member, that's something you literally felt in your bones. The audio was so rollicking. It's something that you came out of feeling physically affected by, um, I think, as well. And it, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting experience that stayed in my memory, definitely. Yeah, me too. And um, also, Al, I've been really pleased and following closely the development of MIFS VR experiences mm -hmm. as well. And in fact, one of our own students, um, Ben Andrews, was able to mm -hmm. test a prototype of his VR creative work um, at MIF last year as well. So all yeah. of those experiences have been, you know, um, really incredible for us, all of our audiences, um, audiences and our students as well. VR is a really fascinating space, I think. It's something, yeah, it came into our festival program in 2016 and a number of festivals have adopted it to kind of lesser or greater extents. And I think what attracted us to the space, and it's, it's a pretty challenging um, project to put on um, for a number of reasons. I mean, the production and I mean, the technology specifically changes year to year and develops and emerges. Um, but what is exciting to us about that space is that it's a frontier space in terms of, I think, uh, VR experience making and programming. It's a space that festivals and VR producers and audiences are learning simultaneously. It's a space where there's a lot of risk-taking experimentation because the grammar of that space and its storytelling um, is emerging and so people are able to push and pull it in different directions and we've found a really interesting really positive really wonderful collaborative um, I guess sense from members of the VR community who are willing to take those risks together thinking about how audiences themselves respond and are actually part of that experience and kind of define things is, is another really interesting dynamic um, in that space as well. It's also um, been part of what we teach and a big change to what we teach over the last, um, you know, maybe five years. So um, I teach first year screen studies and we've built VR into the final week as exactly as you say, almost a kind of frontier for what cinema is. And we still teach, you know, um, classical cinema and classical narrative, but we move towards VR as well as a, as a way to explore really what the future is. But I mm. imagine that all of this has changed things for you. I mean, the pandemic as mm. well. And I'm wondering um, how that changes the work that you do for the festival and also how audiences will um, experience the festival and even things like VR this time. Mm. Mm. Oh, look, hugely. Um, you know, we were working uh, on the festival in terms of Myth's 69th edition, which was intended to be um, this August as a regular delivery, um, you know, right up to our point of cancellation, uh, essentially in, in April. Yeah, look, the, the, the background, I guess, to our cancellation was a couple of things. It was thinking very 
clearly and very methodically um, and very pragmatically and in a lot of detail about um, maintaining what would be the necessary and responsible levels of public health and safety in a scale presentation. Again, knowing that you know we're talking about an audience scale of 190,000 or thereabouts. Um, and what does that actually look like? Um, it was thinking about August in terms of degrees of uncertainty. And so, you know, there, there may um, be a situation where cinemas are reopened, but in that instance, you may have gathering brand, uh, bands to a degree um, overlapped with that. You may have social distancing protocols overlap with that. You may have a degree of audience anxiety about returning to spaces of cultural gatherings. And when you put those in combination, then they create a huge degree of uncertainty in terms of the operational delivery of the festival. That decision, while very difficult, while heartbreaking for, for us internally and, and also, you know, knowing the connection that our audience has to us, you know, obviously we, we understand um, how deeply it is felt um, through a variety of, of, of our public and our stakeholders, um, but certainly the responsible one um, we felt to take at, at that time very much so. Um, and so in terms of, I guess, thinking forward from that, I mean, what we wanted to, to do in this situation was essentially to, to pivot. Um, and it's a it's a quite a hard pivot. Um, Myth sixty eight and a half um, is our online um, film showcase offering for this year. It's not a direct substitute as we imagine it for the festival. Myth is something that is at its core delivered in cinemas. It brings people together in physical spaces, um, and it celebrates film specifically in in that context. And to sustain what we do, which is you know bringing the story of the world, it's presenting incredible world cinema, and it's finding audiences this year on their own terms. Um, it's an interesting challenge, and it's a very interesting space to pivot into quickly as well as a number of festivals have, have found internationally too. Um, how we imagine the space is around forty to yeah around forty features, um, thirty to forty shorts, which will form the core of our shorts awards delivered online. Um, a virtual delivery of Myth Talks, and we will sustain our Critics Campus program, which is a talent developmental program with emerging film critics um, mentorship, um, and uh, I, I guess specifically a response to the role of the critic in an online or digital space, um, given that we have the opportunity to, to do that this year. Um, there is interesting positive opportunity in the space. It, it kind of makes you think, well, what can we do this year that we never could be able to do in a regular year, and how can we actually um, use that as a positive opportunity. So how can we approach, you know, a whole lot of people that would probably never get on a plane and fly 25 hours to Australia in the middle of winter um, because of their schedules. So it's, it's about rethinking how we, how we can navigate the situation in a, in a positive and creative way. It must have been a really difficult time to make those changes and I'm not sure if MIF has actually ever cancelled in its no, history. First First time, first time. Yeah. yeah. The shift to Myth 68 and a half is just, it just sounds so exciting and magnificent and almost doing exactly what we need to do and what we know that film does, which is to create that connection and to, and Myth 68 and a half is maintaining that connection, even if it's just virtual, a virtual connection is still part mm. of that community, as you say. It's almost like your audiences are going from audiences to much more of a kind of connected community. And you also are, are then able to expand that community, as you say, beyond borders virtually mm. to people who haven't been able to previously come to Melbourne as well. So I hope everyone's just putting it in their diary. Oh yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's things which are completely new on the audience front for us this year and at a basic level, you know, this is an Australian level offering as opposed to a, a Melbourne level offering. It's, you know, Australian geo blocked. So, you know, it'll be the most accessible it has ever been. I mean, we, we do our traveling film showcase um, through, you know, essentially eight regional centers each year, but this is, you know, full access in terms of regional community, interstate community, um, we view the development of this platform as an investment for us. You know, MIF will return to its, its regular point of presentation, but you also have to be very mindful of how, I guess, long-term shifts in, in audiences um, may create an ongoing 
need or opportunity for this kind of platform offering as well. Um, and I'm really pleased to see a myth growing its audience, but it always has had that really great connection with kids as well. Mm. Always had, uh, you know, over recent years, that really strong um, kids uh, programming stream as well, which is fantastic. Yeah, we had um, our family gala was H's for Happiness um, last year, one of the premier fun films. And that was that was extraordinary. That was one of the highlights, I think, with um, our, our youth programming of recent years. We took over the Asta, had, you know, a thousand kids and their parents running riot on the, the Rice Krispies. We had a miniature horse on the red carpet with um, someone tasked with following following that round with a poop <laughs> after the whole time that that dubious honor um but yeah it was it was really wonderful it was it was amazing to see that kind of that kind of family connection there well, i also wanted to ask um about films and the importance of films so i'm um, of course really keen to know what you've been watching while you've been in lockdown as well whether it's films that you know provide an escape to from from you know the real concern about what's been happening over the last you know, mm. few months overseas and certainly here as well. So interested to know what you've been watching. Yeah, definitely. Well, look, a lot of what I've been watching has actually been for MIF, like in, in, in you know, in continuing programming terms. So, you know, I'll, I'll watch films every day. I watch, you know, maybe 600 films a year or thereabout. So it's, it's a habitual part of my day. And so I think there's a particular kind of sort of escapism um that that kind of resonates now um it's not solving the situation but you know there's that calming soothing kind of easy property to a, a number of kind of things which kind of almost act to, to yeah to soothe or to simplify something which is very complicated and unknowable and difficult and tragic um so i completely understand people kind of leaning into that side in terms of what they watch um being that much more lighter that much more escapist that much more diverting in these kind of times and and then of course you've got a whole lot of people who are watching contagion and, and watching anything pandemic thing because they lean into that kind of side um for me one of the things i've actually um, just started watching that I've I've never had the time or capacity to really watch before and it probably skews a bit more to the second category of things is um, uh, Damon Lindelof's The uh, the Leftovers, the HBO show, um, because as a TV series built about the philosophical ramifications of the world suddenly losing 2% of its population, there's something that is incredibly prescient um, about, about watching something like that and thinking in those terms. It was something really interesting and quite intriguing to watch specifically at this time. Yeah. How about you? Really over the last couple of months, I've been um, revisiting uh, French poetic realist films. So I've been watching uh, Jacques Demy's films, um, Agnes Varda's husband, of course. Um, so went back to watching um, Lola, which is mm -hmm. a book on Stan and streaming as well. So really interested in, in watching um, his early films, you know, Lola as performer and escort, but also thinking about the relationships in those films as well, which are kind of bizarre relationships where, you know, people meet in bookshops and then are invited to dinner immediately. These really incredible um, uh, kind of almost forced relationships, which actually also just seem to work. They're very spontaneous, they're unimagined, um, and they kind of seem to work. But it's really, um, uh, I think it's a great film, Lola, because it's really also endearing. Um, so there's a lot of kind of um, references to Lola's younger son, who, whilst Lola is performing and busy in the cabaret, you know, the younger son needs to dress himself and, you know, and look after himself and play as well. So there's that sense of kind of independence there. And I'm really interested also in um, how uh, his films kind of start, almost start in the middle. So this film, Lola started with, almost with a car accident. So it starts in absolute, you know, threat and chaos, but actually ends up really well for Lola. Most recently, I've watched a film called Antoine and Antoinette, which is Jacques Becker's film. Mm -hmm. And I had not seen that before, the working class couple who are, you know, also surrounded by chaos in every aspect of their lives. And then they, uh, 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 Antoinette buys a lottery ticket and win, wins 800,000 French francs 
uh, and uh, Antoine loses it as well. So these films for me are really um, uh, interesting because I guess they're um, uh, engaging in around issues of you know chaos, but also luck and chance and fate as mm. well. Um, and also films that are made at really significant historical moments. So in the 1940s, um, but certainly in the 1960s for Jacques Demy, who's, you know, making films during that era that is really a revolutionary social and cultural time, but also for French cinema as well. So at a time of great change, these films kind of emerge. And I'll be really interested, interested to see what films emerge from this experience now and and how those stories are told as well new ways of telling those stories mm. i've been watching the kind of reporting um and particularly i think it was a, a new york newspaper who had yesterday you know the front page filled with names of people who had been lost their own citizens their own community members as well so i've been interested in how people narrate personal stories about that sense of extreme loss, cataclysmic loss. Mm, unimaginable loss. When you think about the numbers, and I mean, this is a situation where by definition people are isolated, unable to connect. So just being able to convey and understand the scale of loss of, and the magnitude of the situation is an extraordinary challenge. And it's an, it's an, it's an unthinkable line to, to get your head across. So, you know, the films who undertake the responsibility of trying to make that situation vivid to an audience, it's an incredible challenge, I think. The last films that I had seen in a cinema, one is an event, actually. So I watched the film, of course, but actually I was much more taken by what was happening around. We went to see Amazing Grace, and I know that Miff showed Amazing Grace as well. I was the last year. Mm -hmm. And, um, this was Sidney Pollack's film that he made in the 1970s, I think it was 1972, where he shot Aretha Franklin singing um, gospel songs backed by a choir at the New Temple Missionary Baptist Church. An amazing kind of live filming of not only the songs, which were amazing and transcendent, and just her voice as a young woman singing, which was, you know, beyond anything else, but also those moments in between the songs as well, when they were setting up and they were talking and they were checking things as well. So real insight into, um, you know, how this film was made, you know, what would ordinarily be left on the cutting room floor. And then we heard the songs as well. Mm -hmm. So I know that originally um, Aretha didn't want this footage released as well, but that um, just beyond her passing, her family was really pleased to see the, this amazing, wonderful footage released as well. It was such a great experience of watching a film in a cinema. I noticed also even that Mick Jagger came in at the end and or on the second day or second night, and I think he was sitting up the back just kind of rocking out as well. So um, just such a special experience of seeing a film with, you know, big screen, great sound. The only, my only issue was that, you know, it was so good. I didn't want to be sitting down. I wanted to be up and moving. Dancing in the aisles. Oh, in fact, yeah, when we played it, Miff, that's exactly what happened. You had, um, yeah, screenings of people who just, yep, got up, started to have a book in the aisles, as you kind of want to do with that film. It's a fascinating document. It's a, it's a film where you really feel you're up close with, with her, that you're in the room, that you really soak up this incredible atmosphere. The filmmaking, as, as, as Verite, is just kind of extraordinary in conveying the mood and the energy and the excitement in a really rare way. And you're right, when it kind of cuts kind of seemingly randomly to, to Mick Jagger kind of sitting there wowed in the crowd. It kind of all puts it into perspective very well. I mean, that's a, that's a film that has had a long journey getting to cinemas and screens. Um, it's very much a film that I see as a cinema experience, as a theatre scale experience, because you just want that scale of vision and that incredible sound and that energy of an audience to, to view it with. Al, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I could really listen to you talk about film and filmmaking and myth and festivals all day. Um, and um, really appreciate the time that you spent with us and the insight and information that you offered. So thank you so much.
It's a pleasure, Wendy. Thank you so much. Um, to everyone listening, be well, be safe. Um, we hope to see you online for MIF 68 and a half and back in cinemas as soon as we can. Um, thanks again. <laughs>